you should know. This ain't the same old story. And the same old song and dance. Don't speak of fading glory. Cause you won't get a second chance. To tell you something I'm someone you can trust You better take a good hard look Cause it's a diamond in this dust It is We got room for the next extension Well, the reunion of Twisted Sister really needs to be traced back to the very end of the first phase of the band, which was in 1987. When it ended, it was one of the most bitter breakups in the uh, history of rock, and it really had to do with a lot of jealousy, bitterness, backstabbing amongst the band members. It was so bad, I really didn't think that the band would ever see the light of day again. I really figured it would never, ever happen again, and for the next nine years, nobody spoke except for me and Mark. This is kind of the interesting way it all slowly got back together. The final show that we played in Minneapolis was known to me as the final show. Um, because 
Uh, I have managed the band on and off during the 15 years that the band was performing. Um, I was always privy to information that most band members were not because either they just chose not to know or they weren't told the communication wasn't all that good. I knew the, the show in Minneapolis was going to be the final show only in that we had decided to pull the plug on the tour and uh, pack it in. The members of the band were basically not even speaking to, to each other at that point, especially myself and Dee. Um, Dee had uh, basically segregated himself from the rest of the band and we weren't on speaking terms although we were touring. But things weren't really going well out there on the road and we weren't getting along really well so uh, uh, some decision was made to uh, pull the plug on that date. It was rough. I, I mean it was rough living it knowing that the end was near and you weren't sure where it was and when it was going to happen but it happened and it was, it was instantaneous and it was over. When I realized the band was over was when he called and made his formal announcement that he was leaving the band. And something was mentioned about that I was missing in action. When the band finished playing, uh, there was really two camps at this point. Uh, A.J. Perro was not in the band at that point. Um, Joe Franco was. He was a hired hand, a very good friend of ours, but a hired hand. So you had Dee and Eddie basically on one side and me and Mark on the other. Dee wanted to go solo, really made it, and, and made it clear and apparent to everyone he didn't like the, uh, the ability, uh, abilities of us as musicians at the time. Love is for Suckers was supposed to be my solo album initially. The music on there was supposed to be for a solo record. And I've often thought that if the record companies and management who encouraged me to do this record with Twisted Sister, um, if they had left it alone and allowed me to go off and done this record, got it out of my system, so to speak, had allowed the band and myself a little time, a little separation, breathing room, that maybe the whole project would have gone on longer and lasted longer. I think if I wanted to continue on, we would have, uh, and I was tired. I was really tired. I mean, I, you know, for me, being the only original member, it had been 15 years, and you know, something like, for me, 9,000 shows, if you look at the days, the early days of five, four or five shows a night, six nights a week, you know, 9,000 shows, roughly. Um, I was tired, and I just wanted a break. The rec company and the management encouraged me to use this music as the next Twisted Sister record, and um, I think that they just forced uh, an already bad situation and made matters worse, so the clock was ticking for the end of the band. I guess we all figured that uh, without Dee it wouldn't be the same and we just decided to just dissolve. I mean, we never even officially broke up or made an announcement or anything. It was just like, we just disappeared. Since I originally joined the band in 78, up until including right now, JJ and I have been best of friends. And we always spoke, always spoke. And we were basically running the business, which only lasted a few months after that. I think it was about uh, February of 88 where we just looked at each other and said, we're closing this down it's done, it's over. Although nothing happened after that last date in 87, it still ran as a business. I just chose to uh, completely end it. I didn't want to play my guitar. I didn't want to, I didn't even want to see a show.
Well, you know, over the years, from 87 to 97, I'll be honest with you, I used to dream about the band reforming and playing. And occasionally I would mention it to Mark, and his, uh, his memories were not as fond as mine. He would always say, it'll never happen, it'll never happen, it'll never happen. And, uh, you know, we would have these conversations, theoretical conversations, but we weren't talking as a band, so it never seemed like it was going to happen. Uh, what really went down was in 96, D and I patched up our differences and it, it, it really happened over uh, about seven hours in a conversation in my kitchen. Uh, the following year, he asked me how I would feel about possibly having the band play at Speaks, which is one of our most famous clubs in a kind of Long Island band reunion with famous other Long Island bands. When we got together in 97 to play at Speaks, uh, it, you know, it felt cool you know, to say we're a twisted fucking sister, but in all honesty, Mark Daniel Mendoza was missing. I wasn't there. I was completely, completely against this band, stepping stepping on stage with this band, or playing with D, or being involved with D in any, in any manner at that time. Mark still didn't want to get involved in it, so we did it without Mark, and it was extraordinary. We did three songs, and it felt phenomenal to be on stage at Speaks, which was really the home of what I thought was the best shows we ever played as a band anywhere in the world. It was a great experience. Uh, the sound was phenomenal. Um, 
The guitar sound that I, the amp I was using just sounded perfect, the monitors, and it sounded like we had never broken up. It's just to be on stage, I guess, with the four out of the five was uh, very hopeful, and it was a step in the right direction after all the years of, of trying to get these guys even to talk. Uh, when we first started, nobody actually was, was talking, probably me out of anybody was talking to each individual member. Uh, we were slowly reassembling the pieces of the band, and by that I don't mean necessarily performing aspect of it, as friends first and foremost. Uh, and it was nice to get to a point where the majority of the band were friends and together and to step up there on the stage and have that moment. In 1999, Phil Carson uh, was trying to get the band back together, and he called me and he said, look, can the band record a song for Dee's movie? We still, as a band, hadn't, um, hadn't truly reunited. We uh, hadn't been together, we never really talked. JJ approached me and uh, said that uh, Dee had approached him. Dee and I spoke, um, he's the one that kind of asked me to do it. I remember him calling me and telling me that and I, I, I said I can't give you an answer right away, I'm gonna have to think about this one because I don't know if, it, if it's a good mix to put me and Dee in the same room together. Heroes of Hard is Fine was still an incomplete moment for me in the reunion of the band. We were trying to reunite in baby steps because the idea of all of us actually really being together was still problematic. One thing that was weird, that we were never in the room at the same time, like all five guys, it was either two of us or three of us, but never all five of us at the same time. We all came in at different times and did different parts on the songs. At no point were five guys together. So there was four out of five of us in rehearsals, and then we went in as individuals to record the pieces. It was great to all get back together and be in the studio like old times. Everything kind of seemed to be going in the right direction, in the positive direction. And it gave us all the chance to get back together and maybe try to heal some wounds. That moment where all five of us were in the room simultaneously sharing that Twisted Sister experience had not yet existed. And we still were not, quote, reunited. On uh, the following year, 2000, I got a call from the uh, personal assistant to Jason Flom. He was being honored by the United Jewish Appeal as Man of the Year. Well, the Jason Flom party was really interesting. He called me and asked me if I would just be there as a, you know, just as a participant, uh, you know, because it was a historical thing for him. He'd become the president of Lava Records. He's a very successful record executive. He's now the president of, of Atlantic. But he started at Atlantic when we were signed, and he was responsible for a great deal of our success at Atlantic Records. And Jason is one of the few people who, who could do this with the band. The whole thing was staged as a big surprise for Jason Flau, a person who was instrumental in getting the band signed and a friend of the band, definitely a good friend of the band. The Blue Man Group would start off by playing a Twisted Sister song and we would pop out from nowhere and, and actually do the performance. When the Blue Man Group agreed to do that, then the onus was to try to get the five guys together. And when I called everybody individually, everybody said, okay, fine. It's for Jason, we'll do it. And they were kind of singing along with the Blue Man Group, thinking this is kind of cute, it's Jason, it's we're not going to take it, it's the Blue Man Group. And we were standing, hiding off to the side, and all these executives are singing pretty robustly in the back. And we're just going, wow, this is kind of weird, you know, this is, this is uh, the industry elite. And they brought us on and everybody, the whole place was just shocked. And then all of a sudden it changes from the lyrics to, would you please welcome for the first time in 15 years, the original Twisted Sister, and we walked out on stage, and the place went nuts. And then going on after the Blue Man Group was, uh, <laughs> was a trip in itself. Those guys were great. This was, in fact, the first time I believe all five members of the band were together in one place. Once we got on stage and actually performed as a band, the magic came back. We realized that it took five guys to make this happen. And that was the first time the whole five guys 
uh, with Mendoza included, the original band got back together in, uh, I think at the time it was going on 12 years or something like that. We plugged in and uh, you know what? I mean, we didn't rehearse and I hadn't played guitar in ages and the song is in the key of E and I went into the key of A and I screwed up the first verse and I completely, I went into the chorus early because we hadn't rehearsed it. Well, it was it was cool. Um, it was kind of nerve-wracking because there was uh, people there that we haven't seen in years. All of these you know, rock stars rushing the stage: Kid Rock, Mark McGrath from Sugar Ray, Sebastian Bach, of course. Uh, and it was just wild to see them acting like such fans. It was it was really we were surprised. And we looked around at each other and said, "Yeah, this is this is this is a lot of fun. You know, we miss doing this." realized that it was a it was a good thing and we enjoyed it and of course doing it for Jason Flom because he was always in our corner uh, he was always someone who appreciated Twisted Sister and, and tried to help us out and was always backing us no matter what he could do he always tried to help so it was a good thing a bit tense but a good thing The last time I was here, this was the show. This show right here, whacking open air. The greatest heavy metal event in the fucking world, baby! I told them there's some crazy motherfuckers at whacking. Got any crazy motherfuckers here tonight? I told them, there's some wild motherfuckers at Wacken. Any wild motherfuckers here tonight? But more than anything, I told them at Wacken, there's a shitload of sick motherfuckers. Any sick motherfuckers here tonight? Well, sick motherfuckers, let's get this thing going with something from the first album. This is called Destroyer! Decide the good and bring replicas. 
The VH1 special behind the music on Twisted Sister uh, was, uh, was interesting because like a lot of things, it's, it's edited and put together through the eyes of a producer who didn't live it. I felt that it was great in the fact that it was probably uh, the, best, the best way to show how we all felt and how we all, uh, we cared about each other, we loved each other, we hated each other and all of that came together. It definitely impacted uh, my life in a, in a big way. I had no idea that um, so many people were gonna see that show, especially the first day it aired. It was, you know, people saw it, people were interested, people were compelled, the ratings were good. 9-11 occurred about a month after VH1 did the behind the music for the band, and it's, it's important to keep this in context because behind the music, again, reformed Twisted to tell the story of Twisted Sister, and, uh, and, and we still were never together, the five band members, it was all done separately. And when it was broadcast, the uh, bad feelings that Behind the Music exposed were so raw um, that immediately upon me watching it on, on VH1, I said, whoa, any thought that I ever would have had that the band would ever reunite was completely squashed because too much bitterness was exposed. So all of the bad feelings that the Behind the Music brought up were completely dissipated instantaneously by the desire for the band members to help in any way to raise money for any cause that seemed viable. So we agreed to play New York Steel at the Hammerstein Ballroom and uh, it was a great night and that was the first time we actually had stood on stage in a concert setting and got up and did what we did best. You know, we were playing the kind of music that really represented the heart of America. And that's real pissed off in your face, fuck you music, you know? That's the message you want to send. I mean, we didn't really want to lose sight why we were there. And of course, uh, you know, Mike Piazza from the Mets was there, which was real cool, and Eddie Trunk, and um, all the bands that played, um, uh, friends of ours that we've known for years, that um, performed well. And we went up, we performed well. Obviously, we didn't wear the makeup. That was a great, great experience. It was nice for us to come out and just play and, you know, not have to worry about makeup or anything like that. Just straight ahead rock and roll and uh, regular clothes. And, you know, it was a great experience. I think it kind of led to the eventual, you know, reunion. Don't hit the new door! The reaction was astounding, but nobody in the band wanted to make the event anything other than what it was. New Yorkers helping New Yorkers. It's happened here in New York. It's fucking tragic. We've got to do something. What we can do is we can get together and play to help raise some money for the families of the victims of the attack. On the lead guitar, please, let's hear it for Jay, Jay French! On the bass guitar, everybody, Mark the Idol of Mendoza! On the lead guitar, Eddie Fingers Ojedo! Away in the back, on the drums, the one and only AJ Perrow! Only Marvel Steve Bucket Fighter! Who won't you come We were great. I mean, we, we went on without makeup. It was just t-shirts and jeans, but we had a great time, meaning it was the right thing to do for the right cause. Some 
people around these parts said they always knew it would take a national disaster to reunite Twisted Sister because we're here tonight for all the people out there you know who they are who gave their lives for us at the World Trade Center look out so we're here tonight to say fuck you to all the terrorists and to say fuck you to Osama Bin Laden Shoot them down! Because on September 11th, it blew our minds, it brought tears to our eyes, when we saw radio stations all over the country taking our song and making it the anthem for an angry generation. Making it the anthem for the United States of America that's ready to fight back. Ah! It took another year and many offers to get the band to the point of actually deciding to reunite the way the fans really wanted to see us. But just you try and stop us! Thank you, everybody!
Because I knew that we could get together for New York Steel, I was confident musically we could play again. The question is how we were going to look. So for all the jokes we can make about middle-aged, you know, transvestites and so on and so forth, the fact is, is you don't want to look bad. The Dee's wife did a great job on making age-appropriate costumes and the designs that she, that she chose and, and made for us definitely flattered everybody. The makeup was the hardest part. I was like, put it all crooked. I had to do it like 16 different times, but uh, it felt good. And as long as I didn't look like, you know, like an aging drag queen, that, that's all that, that mattered to me. Uh, putting the makeup back on was kind of uh, interesting. I, I did it in the privacy of my own home. And I remember walking around with the makeup on and waking my daughter up, who was six or seven years old at the time. She was sleeping. And I said, and I got my makeup on. Don't be freaked out. You know, and she opened up her eyes and she just smiles, you know, because she's seen pictures and stuff. And uh, it was definitely odd. I'm the only guy in the band that's really not wearing makeup and a fancy costume. Uh, and there are reasons for that. Uh, my regular life, I can't have hair that looks like that. And yes, I still do have all of my hair. It's all back here in a ponytail. So we found a happy medium and I'm wearing toned down clothing and I'm not wearing makeup and I'm wearing sunglasses. I used to kind of feel like it was a, you know, like a football player, a baseball player, you know, putting on his jock strap and his cup, and spikes, you know, sweatbands and putting the shit under the eyes, you know, and uh, the gloves. That's how I kind of felt. It was like going out for, you know, a sporting event. But now I kind of look at it all differently. It's like now I'm an actor and I'm in a Broadway show and I'm up there portraying a part. Man, that first day we did it was in a club in Connecticut. And we were not billed as Twisted Sister. We were billed as another, as Bent Brother. Nobody knew we were gonna do it. So we were in a hotel room about a mile away putting the stuff back on. And it literally was the first time I put that stuff on in, in, since 1987 and you know it felt eerie and it felt comfortable all at the same time. But the minute we walked on stage and the guitars came on and the lights hit and the drums went, you go into automatic pilot and it's 19, not only 1984 all over again, it's 1977. still here for us and we love you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Believe me. Believe me. This is something that is so special. It doesn't happen in any other kind of music. In pop music, they forget in 10 seconds. I don't even want to talk about rap. But when it comes to metal, metal fans stay true to bands for years and we thank you for that. We also promise you that on our website, there's going to be tons of pictures from this. We're whack and we love you. So check out that website, twistedsister.com. And we'd like to dedicate this to all of you for maintaining the spirit of rock and roll. It is called You Can't Stop Rock and Roll. <laughs>
one is on the Come Out and Play album. It's called The Fire Still Burns. Just to reiterate, uh, the USO asked us if we would be interested in performing for the troops, and we definitely want to support the men and women who are fighting and protecting this country, and we thought it was a great way to start a reunion tour. Plus, you know, with any luck going over to South Korea, they'll take one look at us and say, well, if this is what the American women look like, we don't want to mess with the American <laughs> men. You know, when people are away from home, especially here in, in the Army, it, it, you get very homesick, and we're just trying to make them feel as comfortable yeah, as possible. Yeah, bringing a very strange little taste of home. A strange taste of home. <laughs> One of the first things we did when we decided to get back together is we were approached by the USO. The shows we did overseas for the USO were pretty cool. I mean, they were very cool and kind of a good way to start our reunion together. They just appreciate it so much. It's unbelievable. I mean, every base you go to, these guys know everybody's name. They know exactly uh, what you do in the band. They know all the songs. We're trying to figure out a way to come back where we would have the least exposure to failure. And we figure what better way to do it than to play for the troops in a country 10,000 miles away so that if you suck, nobody's gonna know about it and they'll be under orders to applaud or they'll be shot or something. We showed that we cared, you know? And what was even the best part about that is I was considered one of the tallest people over there against the North Koreans, which was really cool. I had a great time. I really did. I had an amazing time going there. I did so many things 
You get to see what the people in the world don't see because you're there firsthand. Flying in Chinook helicopters every single day, sitting on the rear door with it open. It was amazing. That was great. What a rush. We all have, in the band and, and in our, our team, we all have our various political views on what's right and what's wrong with the world and war and no war, but everybody in the band is supportive of the military. There's no two ways about it. We all have family and friends that are there. Beyond that, me having so much fun, what we did, what we believe that we did for the troops, which is the most important part, we gave them a little taste of home. The troops loved it. I mean, it was such a morale boost. It was great to be there. The Iraq war had, at least that version of the Iraq war, had just ended. So we were, um, we were honored to be there, honored to play for the troops. It was great to meet these, these amazing men and women who actually put their lives on the line. To be there with them is extraordinary. To go to the demilitarized zone, which we did on our day off, and to confront the North Koreans at gunpoint is an experience that I'll never forget. I mean, most people never have the, the experience of being able to be at one of the flashpoints of the world and, and, to, and to witness what it's like to have global tensions, you know, thrust right in front of your face. Can we take this photo? No gesture. No gesture. No gesture. No gesture. Anybody else want to take, need to take a picture? That's what it's all about, being on the DMZ and see these brave soldiers that are up there guarding the line. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Standing in the line of demarcation, looking at a North Korean soldier, um, you know, going to the most dangerous golf course in the world, uh, firing a 50 caliber machine gun, you know, driving a Humvee around. I mean, soldiers do this every day, but for someone like us who, who don't, it, it was an amazing event. I saw guys who could care less about heavy metal and Twisted Sister, people into different types of music, whether it be rap or hip hop, they were all there and they loved it. And we sat there and signed autographs all night for them. We, we took care of every person that we could possibly take care of and they treated us like gold. It was an amazing experience. The band played really, really well. The audiences were great, uh, especially up by the DMZ at Camp Casey. We played the gym that Ozzy played in the year before. I think MTV covered it. So uh, we agreed to do, um, I think it was three, to, three shows in five or six days. The shows themselves were tremendous. The truth of the matter is, you know, an accordion player would get a great reaction over in, at, the, at the bases. They're so appreciative, the armed forces, of anybody who takes the time to come and play for them, that, that they really roll out the red carpet and treat you like gold. For a band that was vilified by the United States government 15 years ago and 20 years ago as being the worst thing that could ever happen to America's youth, you couldn't get these generals tripping themselves over fast enough to have their photographs taken with, you know, Dee and Mark and Eddie and myself and AJ. And it was really great, you know, things just change over time. It's one of the best things that I've ever done being a Twisted Sister. 9-11 and entertaining our troops in Korea are the best things, the most satisfying things that I've ever done in my career. And it's something I'll never forget for the rest of my life, and it's a part of my life.
You want to do it some more? You want to sing some more? You want to sing some more? Tell him, motherfuckers. Turn the spotlight off. Spotlight off, please, Johnny. There you are. There you are. What? What? Having succeeded in Korea, we were then prepared to go to Sweden to headline Sweden Rock, which was the biggest festival in Sweden that year. Everything is bigger when you're playing into these gigantic stadiums. Uh, we hadn't really gotten our footing back, so the show wasn't as good as we really wanted it to be. But it was very, very important for us to go through that and to remind us what we had to do because we were literally given keys to the kingdom by all these promoters who said, Twisted Sisters back. Yeah, you really have to have it together. So Sweden Rock, you know, set the stage for the shows to come. The band got offers to headline some of the largest uh, outdoor festivals in Europe, Bang Your Head, Whackin' Open Air, and a few others, and we immediately were asked to headline. It doesn't matter how many years go by, we still have that fierce mentality on stage, and you know, the, the attitude and everything comes along with it. Every big festival we've played over Europe has been successful. Now to play in front of 45,000 people and be the headlining band after so many years of not playing together was a real humbling experience. Wacken was probably the biggest audience, but um, it was just an incredible experience to come back after 17 years and, and be headlining these, these huge festivals. It was a great experience. We are bigger in some countries now than we were when we left. It's kind of mind-blowing to go into a festival for, you know, 40,000 plus people and be the headliner. When the last time you were there, you were like sixth or seventh on the bill. And you haven't played. Bizarre. The responsibility that we had as a headliner to go out and actually close these shows with extraordinary bands and we are asked to come out of dormancy, 16 years of dormancy, and you know, can we deliver? And the fact that we did deliver was extremely satisfying um, professionally. When we walked off of Whack and Open End, when that show, we said goodnight that show, if the band stopped playing at that point, we had closure. We hear your voices! Sister is everywhere with you tonight. 
And we want to play a song. All right, I just want to see all the motherfuckers out there. I want to see. I don't got much more to say on this one, so. This next song means a lot to us. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. From the Stay Hungry album. We hope this means something to you. This is what's called The Price. From 1973 to 1987, I lived the life of a rock performer star. I mean, I looked it all the time, I, I drank it, I felt it, you know, I was, th that's who I was. And then all this period goes by when you're just 
not that. And then you have to be it again. And so I found myself portraying J.J. French. And the difference between the two is that I was, I was it, and now I'm acting it. You know, when we go in and start singing these songs, the first time I started singing Twisted songs, I'm going, man, I was pissed off. Listen to these words, they're like, fuck, venom. I'm really angry guy, I was angry guy. Going back to the end of Twisted Sister when we broke up, I was an angry young man. And uh, I looked for trouble. You know, I went through my own things and I'm, I'm a better person for the demise of the band and for the success of the band. Uh, so as I do these things, I just sit there marveling at how fucking insane I was. Now I, I do everything from a sort of reflective point of view. I'm no longer that person. Uh, I've grown and matured and I, I, I feel a lot better than I felt back in those days. This has been one of the toughest things for the band to accept is that I'm not the D. Snyder of those days, the miserable fuck. Uh, that made their lives a living hell. I look back at it now, I realize how silly it was, but I was angry at the world for my career being ripped out from underneath me. It wasn't over for me then. I mean, it never ended for me. It's just, it's just change. You grow up and you go past these things. But uh, I'm calmer, I'm wiser. I'm enjoying life now more. I'm also working harder than I've ever worked just to be a success or trying to be a success. And uh, it, it's, uh, I think, twice or three times before I, I react to something now. I think over time I've learned to be uh, more sensitive, more considerate of other people's feelings. I think in a positive sense, I matured as a person. I matured as a player. Um, haven't quite reached my pinnacle yet as a player. Being home to, uh, to see your kids grow up and things like that, that uh, I might not have been able to do had I been on the road constantly. Um, I think it made a big difference in the way uh, my kids are. The big difference now between the way it's perceived, especially for me, is that um, 20 years later, we're all different in how we perceive ourselves, of course, but how we look at each other. And I think we have a lot more fun. There's such an emphasis for us to, to be great showmen. And to be great showmen, you literally are putting on a face, a game face, and going out there and doing it. But in the past, that game face and the J.J. French on the street were not that far apart. Now it's, it's vastly different. I'm a father, and I kind of put the J.J. French person in this third person situation where what is, what is that guy doing in the next two weeks? He's out there going up and running around and getting crazy, and then he's disappearing back into his personal life of not being that. So. That is really the big difference. Do you know what those words are, Wacken? Do you know what those words are? You're gonna burn in hell! I'm burn in hell! You can't believe all the things I've performed in my life Without even trying
see no evil, no too late, no evil, down on me, say, think no evil, don't you think no evil, don't you play with evil, cause I'm free, hear no evil, don't you see no evil, don't you lay no evil, down on me, speak no evil, don't you think no evil, don't you play with evil, cause I'm free. more to do. One more piece of business to take care of before we go home. And this song, I want to see some jumping. I want to see some shouting, screaming, crazy, wild, sick fucking shit going on, Wacken. I want to see you motherfuckers lose your minds. Because if you're ready, are you ready? Turn it on. What about you motherfuckers over there? Are you ready? On that side, are you ready? All the way in the back, are you ready? This is cold. I want to run.
Look at them. Look at them. Turn your camera over there. Look at them. Look at them. Now let's see what you got in you, wackhead. Let's see what you can fucking do. I wanna rock! Not bad. Not bad. You weren't ready. Now you're ready. Interesting beat. It's amazing. There's some, still some people who are not doing it. Let me try over here. I want to rock! Come on. I want to rock! All right, all right, all right. Whack it. You can yell rock. But this is the biggest, greatest heavy metal audience in the world. Of course you can yell rock. I want to rock! But here's the test. Here's the test. Let's find the sick motherfuckers. This time, when you yell rock, throw your fist in the air and jump. Jump. I say I want to rock, you go rock! I know not everybody will do it, but the sick motherfuckers will do it. The sick motherfuckers will jump! Let's try it one time. Ready? See the people! No Johnny, no spotlights. It's still on. Spotlights. No, 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 no. People. Let me see the people. Here we go. Let's do it again. Here we go. I wanna rock! rock. I wanna rock! rock. Fuck, guys, stop the music. going anywhere. 
We'll do one more. You want one more? I said, do you want one more? Good. Before we do that, that worked well. Before we do that, I want to introduce you to the band. Many reunions, a lot of reunions, do not have all five original members. What you see here is the original twisted fucking sister up here. And it wasn't easy. So starting in the back, on the drums, still kicking ass after all these years, the one and only AJ Perry! For the old fans, and for the new fans, and for the future fans, thank you. You guys are the best. You make us go up there and do what we do well. And I appreciate that, and I always will. On the bass guitar, Mark the Animal Mendoza! All I have to say is thank you to all the SMFs out there that supported us from then and from now, and we will continue to support you until it's definitely over. And it's not over until you hear from us. On the guitar, in the black and the red, from the Bronx, New York City, baby, the one and only Eddie Fingers Ojeda! I couldn't thank people enough and continue to thank people enough for just all the support throughout the years. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear for J.J. Fred! I know we, we entertained and made a lot of people really happy, but I really know it now because the fans have proven by their loyalty that they thought that what we did was special and it has vindicated and justified all the sacrifice and hard work that I put into it and I think that all the guys will say the same thing. You know, you can look back at that and say, wow, we really impacted people's lives. And there's a great deal of satisfaction in that, and for that, I'll be forever grateful. On lead vocals, everybody, the best fucking frontman on the planet, D fucking Snyder! You believed in the band and me because we had conviction, and we were committed, and we believed. I could give you nothing less than that. I can't, you can't fake that. How I was, how we were, was fucking heartfelt and genuine. All right, we want to dedicate this last one to the promoters of this concert of whacking every year, Thomas and Olga. Guys, this is fucking righteous. This is for you. It's called SMF.
see you over there. <laughs> Your SMF. Come on. Your SMF. Let's go. Your SMF. Say it. Your. Louder. Your. Everybody. Your. In the back. Your. Oh, come on. You're a sick motherfucker. You're a sick motherfucker. Say it. I'm a sick motherfucker, say! I, I don't hear you! I, louder! I, scream on me! I, oh yeah! I, yeah! I'm a SMF! You're an SMF! I'm an SMF! You're an SMF! Thank you, Germany! Thank you, sack motherfuckers! Why can you rock? You can't.